The Champavath Maneater by Jim Corbett Read and recorded by Apratim Viraj Singh Part 1 I was shooting with Eddie Knowles in Milani when I first heard of the tiger, which later received official recognition as the Champavath Maneater. Eddie, who will long be remembered in this province as a sportsman par excellence and the possessor of an inexhaustible fund of shikar yarns, was one of those few and very fortunate individuals who possess the best of everything in life. His rifle was without equal in accuracy and striking power. And while one of his brothers was the best gunshot in India, another brother was the best tennis player in the Indian army. When, therefore, Eddie informed me that his brother-in-law, the best shikari in the world, had been deputed by the government to shoot the Champavath man-eater, it was safe to assume that a very definite period had been put to the animal's activities. The tiger, however, for some inexplicable reason, did not die, and was causing the government a great deal of anxiety when I visited Nainital four years later. Rewards were offered, special shikaris employed, and parties of gurkhas sent out from the depot in Almora. Yet in spite of these measures, the toll of human victims continued to mount alarmingly. The tigress, for such the animal turned out to be, had arrived in Kumau as a full-fledged man-eater from Nepal, from whence she had been driven out by a body of armed Nepalese after she had killed two hundred human beings, and during the four years she had been operating in Kumau had added two hundred and thirty-four to this number. This is how matters stood when shortly after my arrival in Nainital, I received a visit from Bertude. Bertude, who was deputy commissioner of Nainital at that time, and who, after his tragic death, now lies buried in an obscure grave in Haldwani, was a man who was loved and respected by all who knew him. And it is not surprising, therefore, that when he told me of the trouble the man-eater was giving the people of his district, and the anxiety it was causing him, he took my promise with him that I would start for Champavath immediately on receipt of news of the next human kill. Two conditions I made, however, one that the government rewards be cancelled, and the other that the special shikaris and regulars from Almora be withdrawn. My reasons for making these conditions need no explanation, for I am sure all sportsmen share my aversion to being classed as a reward hunter, and are as anxious as I am to avoid the risk of being accidentally shot. These conditions were agreed to, and a week later, Bertude paid me an early morning visit and informed me that news had been brought in during the night by runners that a woman had been killed by the man-eater at Pali, a village between Devithura and Tunakat. In anticipation of a start at short notice, I had engaged six men to carry my camp kit, and leaving after breakfast, we did a march the first day of seventeen miles to Thari. Breakfasting at Mornola next morning, we spent the night at Devithra and arrived at Pali the following evening, five days after the woman had been killed. The people of the village, numbering some fifty men, women and children, were in a state of abject terror. And though the sun was still up when I arrived, I found the entire population inside their homes behind locked doors. And it was not until my men had made a fire in the courtyard and I was sitting down to a cup of tea, that a door here and there was cautiously opened, and the frightened inmates emerged. I was informed that for five days no one had gone beyond their own doorsteps. The insanitary condition of the courtyard testified to the truth of this statement, that food was running short, and that the people would starve if the tiger was not killed or driven away. That the tiger was still in the vicinity was apparent, for three nights it had been heard calling on the road, distant a hundred yards from the houses, and that very day it had been seen on the cultivated land at the lower end of the village. The headman of the village very willingly placed a room at my disposal, but as there were eight of us to share it, and the only door it possessed opened on to the insanitary courtyard, I elected to spend the night in the open. After a scratchy meal, which had to do duty for dinner, I saw my men safely shut into the room, and myself 
took up a position on the side of the road with my back to a tree. The villagers said the tiger was in the habit of perambulating along this road, and as the moon was at the full, I thought there was a chance of my getting a shot, provided I saw it first. I had spent many nights in the jungle looking for game, but this was the first time I had ever spent a night looking for a man-eater. The length of road immediately in front of me was brilliantly lit by the moon, but to right and left the overhanging trees cast dark shadows, and when the night wind agitated the branches and the shadows moved, I saw a dozen tigers advancing on me, and bitterly regretted the impulse that had induced me to place myself at the man-eater's mercy. I lacked the courage to return to the village and admit I was too frightened to carry out my self-imposed task, and with teeth chattering as much from fear as from cold, I sat out the long night. As the grey dawn was lighting up the snowy range which I was facing, I rested my head onto my drawn-up knees, and it was in this position my men an hour later found me fast asleep. Of the tiger, I had neither heard nor seen anything. Back in the village, I tried to get the men, who I could see were very surprised I had survived the night, to take me to the places where the people of the village had from time to time been killed. But this they were unwilling to do. From the courtyard they pointed out the direction in which the kills had taken place. The last kill, the one that had brought me to the spot, I was told, had taken place round the shoulder of the hill to the west of the village. The women and girls some twenty in number, who had been out collecting oak leaves for the cattle when the unfortunate woman had been killed, were eager to give me details of the occurrence. It appeared that the party had set out two hours before midday, and after going half a mile had climbed into trees to cut leaves. The victim and two other women had selected a tree growing on the edge of a ravine, which I subsequently found was about four feet deep and ten to twelve feet wide. Having cut all the leaves she needed, the woman was climbing down from the tree when the tiger, who had approached unseen, stood up on its hind legs and caught her by the foot. Her hold was torn from the branch she was letting herself down by, and pulling her into the ravine, the tiger released her foot, and while she was struggling to rise, caught her by the throat. After killing her, it sprang up the side of the ravine and disappeared with her into some heavy undergrowth. All this had taken place a few feet from the two women on the tree, and had been witnessed by the entire party. As soon as the tiger and its victim were out of sight, the terror-stricken women and girls ran back to the village. The men had just come in for their midday meal, and when all were assembled and armed with drums, metal cooking pots, anything, in fact, that would produce a noise, the rescue party set off the men leading and the women bringing up the rear. Arrived at the ravine in which the woman had been killed, the very important question of what next was being debated when the tiger interrupted the proceedings by emitting a loud roar from the bushes thirty yards away. As one man, the party turned and fled helter-skelter back to the village. When breath had been regained, accusations were made against one and another of having been the first to run and cause the stampede. Words ran high until it was suggested that if no one was afraid and all were as brave as they claimed to be, why not go back and rescue the woman without loss of more time? The suggestion was adopted, and three times the party got as far as the ravine. On the third occasion, the one man who was armed with a gun fired it off, and brought the tiger roaring out of the bushes. After this, the attempted rescue was very wisely abandoned. On my asking the gunman why he had not discharged his piece into the bushes instead of up into the air, he said the tiger was already greatly enraged, and that if by any mischance he had hit it, it would undoubtedly have killed him. For three hours that morning, I walked round the village, looking for tracks and hoping, and at the same time dreading to meet the tiger. At one place in a dark, heavily wooded ravine, while I was skirting some bushes, a covey of college pheasants fluttered, screaming out of them, and I thought my heart had stopped beating for good. 
My men had cleared a spot under a walnut tree for my meals, and after breakfast the headman of the village asked me to mount guard while the wheat crop was being cut. He said that if the crop was not harvested in my presence, it would not be harvested at all, for the people were too frightened to leave their homes. Half an hour later, the entire population of the village, assisted by my men, were hard at work while I stood on guard with a loaded rifle. By evening, the crop from five large fields had been gathered, leaving only two small patches close to the houses, which the headman said he would have no difficulty in dealing with the next day. The sanitary condition of the village had been much improved, and a second room for my exclusive use was placed at my disposal. And that night, with thorn bushes securely wedged in the doorway to admit ventilation and exclude the man-eater, I made up for the sleep I had lost the previous night. My presence was beginning to put new heart into the people, and they were moving about more freely, but I had not yet gained sufficient of their confidence to renew my request of being shown around the jungle, to which I attached some importance. These people knew every foot of the ground for miles round, and could, if they wished, show me where I was most likely to find the tiger, or in any case where I could see its pug marks. That the man-eater was a tiger was an established fact, but it was not known whether the animal was young or old, or male or a female, and this information, which I believed would help me to get in touch with it, I could only ascertain by examining its pug marks. After an early tea that morning, I announced that I wanted meat for my men, and asked the villagers if they could direct me to where I could shoot a ghurul, or a mountain goat. The village was situated on the top of a long ridge running east and west, and just below the road on which I had spent the night, the hill fell steeply away to the north, in a series of grassy slopes. On these slopes, I was told, ghurul were plentiful, and several men volunteered to show me over the ground. I was careful not to show my pleasure at this offer, and selecting three men, I set out, telling the headman that if I found the ghurul as plentiful as he said they were, I would shoot two for the village in addition to shooting one for my men. Crossing the road, we went down a very steep ridge, keeping a sharp lookout to right and left, but saw nothing. Half a mile down the hill, the ravines converged and from their junction there was a good view of the rocky and grass-covered slope to the right. I had been sitting for some minutes, scanning the slope with my back to a solitary pine which grew at this spot, when a movement high up on the hill caught my eye. When the movement was repeated, I saw it was a kural flapping its ears. The animal was standing in grass, and only its head was visible. The men had not seen the movement, and as the head was now stationary and blended in with its surroundings, it was not possible to point it out to them. Giving them a general idea of the animal's position, I made them sit down and watch while I took a shot. I was armed with an old Martini Henry rifle, a weapon that atoned for its vicious kick by being dead accurate, up to any range. The distance was as near two hundred yards as made no matter, and lying down and resting the rifle on a convenient pine root, I took careful aim and fired. The smoke from the black powder cartridge obscured my view, and the men said nothing had happened, and that I had probably fired at a rock or a bunch of dead leaves. Retaining my position, I reloaded the rifle, and presently saw the grass, a little below where I had fired, moving, and the hind quarters of the kural appeared. When the whole animal was free of the grass, it started to roll over and over, gaining momentum as it came down the steep hill. When it was halfway down, it disappeared into heavy grass, and disturbed two kural that had been lying up there. Sneezing their alarm call, the two animals dashed out of the grass and went bounding up the hill. The range was shorter now, and adjusting the leaf sight, I waited until the bigger of the two slowed down and put a bullet through its back. And as the other one turned and made off diagonally across the hill, I shot it through the shoulder. On occasions, one is privileged to accomplish the seemingly impossible. Lying in an uncomfortable position and shooting up at an angle of sixty degrees at a range of two hundred yards at the small white mark on the kural's throat 
there did not appear to be one chance in a million of the shot coming off. And yet, the heavy lead bullet driven by black powder had not been deflected by a hair's breadth, and had gone true to its mark, killing the animal instantaneously. Again, on the steep hillside, which was broken up by small ravines and jutting rocks, the dead animal had slipped and rolled straight to the spot where its two companions were lying up, and before it had cleared the patch of grass, the two companions in their turn were slipping and rolling down the hill. As the three dead animals landed in the ravine in front of us, it was amusing to observe the surprise and delight of the men who never before had seen a rifle in action. All thought of the man-eater was for the time being forgotten as they scrambled down into the ravine to retrieve the bag. The expedition was a great success in more ways than one, for in addition to providing a ration of meat for everyone, it gained me the confidence of the entire village. Shikar yarns, as everyone knows, never lose anything in repetition, and while the ghoodle were being skinned and divided up, the three men who had accompanied me gave full rein to their imagination, and from where I sat in the open having breakfast, I could hear the exclamations of the assembled crowd when they were told that the kudal had been shot at a range of over a mile, and that the magic bullets used had not only killed the animals like that, but had also drawn them to the sahib's feet. After the midday meal, the headman asked me where I wanted to go and how many men I wished to take with me. From the eager throng of men who pressed round, I selected two of my late companions, and with them to guide me set off to visit the scene of the last human tragedy. The people of our hills are Hindus and cremate their dead, and when one of their number has been carried off by a man-eater, it is incumbent on the relatives to recover some portion of the body for cremation, even if it be only a few splinters of bone. In the case of this woman, the cremation ceremony was yet to be performed, and as we started out, the relatives requested us to bring back any portion of the body we might find. From early boyhood, I have made a hobby of reading and interpreting jungle signs. In the present case, I had the account of the eyewitnesses who were present when the woman was killed. But eyewitnesses are not always reliable, whereas... Jungle signs are a true record of all that has transpired. On arrival at the spot, a glance at the ground showed me that the tiger could only have approached the tree one way, without being seen, and that was up the ravine. Entering the ravine a hundred yards below the tree, and working up, I found the pug marks of a tiger in some fine earth that had sifted down between two big rocks. These pug marks showed the animal to be a tigress a little past her prime. Further up the ravine, and some ten yards from the tree, the tigress had lain down behind a rock, presumably to wait for the woman to climb down from the tree. The victim had been the first to cut all the leaves she needed, and as she was letting herself down by a branch, some two inches in diameter, the tigress had crept forward, and, standing up on her hind legs, had caught the woman by the foot and pulled her down into the ravine. The branch showed the desperation with which the unfortunate woman had clung to it, for adhering to the rough oak bark where the branch and eventually the leaves had slipped through her grasp were strands of skin which had been torn from the palms of her hands and fingers. Where the tigress had killed the woman, there were signs of a struggle and a big patch of dried blood. From here the blood trail, now dry but distinctly visible, led across the ravine and up the opposite bank. Following the blood trail from where it left the ravine, we found the place in the bushes where the tigress had eaten her kill. It is a popular belief that man-eaters do not eat the head, hands, and feet of the human victims. This is incorrect. Man-eaters, if not disturbed, eat everything, including the blood-soaked clothes, as I found on one occasion. However, that is another story and will be told some other time. On the present occasion, we found the woman's clothes and a few pieces of bone, which we wrapped up in the clean cloth we had brought for the purpose. Pitifully little as these remains were, they would suffice for the cremation ceremony, which would ensure the ashes of the high-caste woman reaching Mother Ganges. After tea, I visited the scene of yet another tragedy. 
Separated from the main village by the public road was a small holding of a few acres. The owner of this holding had built himself a hut on the hillside just above the road. The man's wife and the mother of his two children, a boy and a girl aged four and six respectively, was the younger of two sisters. These two sisters were out cutting grass one day on the hill above the hut, when the tigress suddenly appeared and carried off the elder sister. For a hundred yards, the younger woman ran after the tigress, brandishing her sickle and screaming at the tigress to let her sister go and take her instead. This incredible act of heroism was witnessed by the people in the main village. After carrying the dead woman for a hundred yards, the tigress put her down and turned on her pursuer. With a loud roar, it sprang at the brave woman, who, turning, raced down the hillside, across the road, and into the village, evidently with the intention of telling the people what they, unknown to her, had already witnessed. The woman's incoherent noises were at the time attributed to loss of breath, fear, and excitement, and it was not until the rescue party that had set out with all speed had returned, unsuccessful, that it was found the woman had lost her power of speech. I was told this tale in the village, and when I climbed the path to the two-roomed hut where the woman was engaged in washing clothes, she had then been dumb for twelve months. Except for a strained look in her eyes, the dumb woman appeared to be quite normal, and when I stopped to speak to her and tell her I had come to try and shoot the tiger that had killed her sister, she put her hands together and, stooping down, touched my feet, making me feel a wretched impostor. True, I had come with the avowed object of shooting the man-eater, but with an animal that had the reputation of never killing twice in the same locality, never returning to a kill, and whose domain extended over an area of many hundred square miles, the chance of my accomplishing my object was about as good as finding a needle in two haystacks. Plans in plenty I had made way back in Nenital. One I had already tried, and wild horses would not induce me to try it again. And the others, now that I was on the ground, were just as unattractive. Further, there was no one I could ask for advice, for this was the first man-eater that had ever been known in Kumau. And yet, something would have to be done. So for the next three days, I wandered through the jungles from sunrise to sunset, visiting all the places for miles round where the villagers told me there was a chance of my seeing the tigress. I would like to interrupt my tale here for a few minutes to refute a rumor current throughout the hills that on this and on several subsequent occasions I assumed the dress of a hill woman and going into the jungle attracted the man-eaters to myself and killed them with either a sickle or an axe. All I have ever done in the matter of alteration of dress has been to borrow a sari and with it draped round me cut grass, or climbed into trees and cut leaves, and in no case has the ruse proved successful, though on two occasions, to my knowledge, man-eaters have stalked the tree I was on, taking cover on one occasion behind a rock and on the other behind a fallen tree, and giving me no opportunity of shooting them. To continue my story, as the tigress now appeared to have left this locality, I decided, much to the regret of the people of Pali, to move to Champavat, fifteen miles due east of Pali. Making an early start, I breakfasted at Thunak Hut, and completed the journey to Champavat by sunset. The roads in this area were considered very unsafe, and men only moved from village to village or to the bazaars in large parties. After leaving Thunak Hut, my party of eight was added to by men from villages adjoining the road, and we arrived at Champavat thirty strong. Some of the men who joined me had been in a party of twenty men who had visited Champavat two months earlier, and they told me the following very pitiful story. Sahib, the road for a few miles on this side of Champavat runs along the south face of the hill, parallel to and about twenty yards above the valley. Two months ago, a party of twenty of us men were on our way to the bazaar at Champavat, and as we were going along this length of the road at about midday, we were startled 
by hearing the agonized cries of a human being coming from the valley below. Huddled together on the edge of the road, we cowered in fright as these cries drew nearer and nearer, and presently into view came a tiger carrying a naked woman. The woman's hair was trailing on the ground on one side of the tiger and her feet on the other. The tiger was holding her by the small of the back and she was beating her chest and calling alternately on God and man to help her. Fifty yards from and in clear view of us, the tiger passed with its burden and when the cries had died away in the distance, we continued in our way. And you twenty men did nothing? No, Sahib, we did nothing, for we were afraid. And what can men do when they are afraid? And further, even if we had been able to rescue the woman without angering the tiger and bringing misfortune on ourselves, it would have availed the woman nothing, for she was covered with blood and would of a surety have died of her wounds. I subsequently learned that the victim belonged to a village near Champavad and that she had been carried off by the tiger while collecting dry sticks. Her companions had run back to the village and raised an alarm, and just as a rescue party was starting, the twenty frightened men arrived. As these men knew the direction in which the tiger had gone with its victim, they joined the party and can best carry on with the story. We were fifty or sixty strong when we set out to rescue the woman, and several of the party were armed with guns. A furlong from where the sticks collected by the woman were lying and from where she had been carried off, we found her torn clothes. Thereafter, the men started beating their drums and firing off their guns, and in this way we proceeded for more than a mile right up to the head of the valley, where we found the woman, who was little more than a girl, lying dead on a great slab of rock. Beyond licking off all the blood and making her body clean, the tiger had not touched her, and there being no woman in our party, we men averted our faces as we wrapped her body in the loin cloths which one and another gave, for she looked as she lay on her back as one who sleeps and would waken in shame when touched. With experiences such as these to tell and retell through the long night watches behind fast shut doors, it is little wonder that the character and outlook on life of people living year after year in a man-eater country should change, and that one coming from the outside should feel that he had stepped right into a world of stark realities and the rule of the tooth and claw, which forced man in the reign of the saber-toothed tiger to shelter in dark caverns. I was young and inexperienced in those far-off Champawat days, but even so, the conviction I came to after a brief sojourn in that stricken land that there is no more terrible thing than to live and have one's being under the shadow of a man-eater has been strengthened by thirty-two years of subsequent experience. The Tahsildar of Champavad, to whom I had been given letters of introduction, paid me a visit that night at the dark bungalow where I was putting up and suggested I should move next day to a bungalow a few miles away in the vicinity of which many human beings had been killed. Early next morning, accompanied by the Tahsildar, I set out for the bungalow, and while I was having breakfast on the veranda, two men arrived with news that a cow had been killed by a tiger in a village ten miles away. The Tahsildar excused himself to attend to some urgent work at Champavad, and said he would return to the bungalow in the evening and stay the night with me. My guides were good walkers, and as the track went downhill most of the way, we covered the ten miles in record time. Arrived at the village, I was taken to a cattle shed in which I found a weak old calf, killed and partly eaten by a leopard. Not having the time or the inclination to shoot the leopard, I rewarded my guides and retraced my steps to the bungalow. Here I found that the Sildar had not returned, and as there was still an hour or more of daylight left, I went out with the Chaukidar of the bungalow to look at a place where he informed me a tiger was in the habit of drinking. This place I found to be the head of the spring which supplied the garden with irrigation water. In the soft earth round the spring were tiger pug marks several days old, 
but these tracks were quite different from the pug marks I had seen and carefully examined in the ravine in which the woman of Bali village had been killed. On returning to the bungalow, I found that the Sildar was back, and as we sat in the veranda, I told him of my day's experience, expressing regret at my having had to go so far on a wild goose chase, he rose, saying that as he had a long way to go, he must start at once. This announcement caused me no little surprise, for twice that day he had said he would stay the night with me. It was not the question of his staying the night that concerned me, but the risk he was taking. However, he was deaf to all my arguments, and as he stepped off the veranda into the dark night, with only one man following him carrying a smoky lantern which gave a mere glimmer of light, to do a walk of four miles in a locality in which men only moved in large parties in daylight, I took off my hat to a very brave man. Having watched him out of sight, I turned and entered the bungalow. I have a tale to tell of that bungalow, but I will not tell it here, for this is a book of jungle stories, and tales beyond the laws of nature do not consort well with such stories. Part 2 I spent the following morning in going round the very extensive fruit orchard and tea garden and in having a bath at the spring, and at about midday the Tahsildar, much to my relief, returned safely from Champawat. I was standing talking to him while looking down a long sloping hill with the village surrounded by cultivated land in the distance, when I saw a man leave the village and start up the hill in our direction. As the man drew nearer, I saw he was alternately running and walking, and was quite evidently the bearer of important news. Telling the Tahsildar I would return in a few minutes, I set off at a run down the hill, and when the man saw me coming, he sat down to take breath. As soon as I was near enough to hear him, he called out, Come quickly, Sahib, the man-eater has just killed a girl. Sit still, I called back and turning round, ran up to the bungalow. I passed the news on to the Tahsildar while I was getting a rifle and some cartridges, and asked him to follow me down to the village. The man who had come for me was one of those exasperating individuals whose legs and tongue cannot function at the same time. When he opened his mouth, he stopped dead, and when he started to run, his mouth closed. So telling him to shut his mouth and lead the way, we ran in silence down the hill. At the village, an excited crowd of men, women, and children awaited us, and as usually happens on these occasions, all started to talk at the same time. One man was vainly trying to quieten the babel. I led him aside and asked him to tell me what had happened. Pointing to some scattered oak trees on a gentle slope a furlong or so from the village, he said a dozen people were collecting dry sticks under the trees when a tiger suddenly appeared and caught one of their number, a girl, sixteen or seventeen years of age. The rest of the party had run back to the village, and as it was known that I was staying at the bungalow, a man had immediately been dispatched to inform me. The wife of the man I was speaking to had been of the party, and she pointed out the tree on the shoulder of the hill under which the girl had been taken. None of the party had looked back to see if the tiger was carrying away its victim, and, if so, in which direction it had gone. Instructing the crowd not to make a noise, and to remain in the village until I returned, I set off in the direction of the tree. The ground here was quite open, and it was difficult to conceive how an animal the size of a tiger could have approached twelve people unseen, and its presence not detected until attention had been attracted by the choking sound made by the girl. The spot where the girl had been killed was marked by a pool of blood, and near it, and in vivid contrast to the crimson pool, was a broken necklace of brightly coloured blue beads which the girl had been wearing. From this spot the track led up and round the shoulder of the hill. The track of the tigress was clearly visible. On one side of it were great splashes of blood where the girl's head had hung down, and on the other side the trail of her feet. Half a mile up the hill I found the girl's sari, and on the brow of the hill her skirt. Once again the tigress was carrying a naked woman, 
but mercifully on this occasion her burden was dead. On the brow of the hill the track led through a thicket of black thorn, on the thorns of which long strands of the girl's raven-black hair had caught. Beyond this was a bed of nettles through which the tigress had gone, and I was looking for a way around this obstruction when I heard footsteps behind me. Turning round, I saw a man armed with a rifle coming towards me. I asked him why he had followed me when I had left instructions at the village that no one was to leave it. He said that the Tahsildar had instructed him to accompany me and that he was afraid to disobey orders. As he appeared determined to carry out his orders, and to argue the point would have meant the loss of valuable time, I told him to remove the heavy pair of boots he was wearing, and when he had hidden them under a bush, I advised him to keep close to me and to keep a sharp lookout behind. I was wearing a very thin pair of stockings, shorts, and a pair of rubber-soled shoes, and as there appeared to be no way round the nettles, I followed the tigress through them, much to my discomfort. Beyond the nettles, the blood trail turned sharply to the left and went straight down the very steep hill, which was densely clothed with bracken and ringles. A hundred yards down, the blood trail led into a narrow and very steep watercourse, down which the tigress had gone with some difficulty, as could be seen from the dislodged stones and earth. I followed this watercourse for five or six hundred yards, my companion getting more and more agitated the further we went. A dozen times he caught my arm and whispered, in a voice full of tears, that he could hear the tiger either on one side or the other or behind us. Halfway down the hill we came on a great pinnacle of rock some thirty feet high, and as the man had by now had all the man-eater hunting he could stand, I told him to climb the rock and remain on it until I returned. Very gladly he went up, and when he straddled the top and signaled to me that he was all right, I continued on down the watercourse, which, after skirting round the rock, went straight down for a hundred yards to where it met a deep ravine coming down from the left. At the junction was a small pool, and as I approached it I saw patches of blood on my side of the water. The tigress had carried the girl straight down in this spot, and my approach had disturbed her at her meal. Splinters of bone were scattered round the deep pug marks into which Discolored water was slowly seeping, and at the edge of the pool was an object which had puzzled me as I came down the watercourse, and which I now found was part of a human leg. In all the subsequent years I have hunted man-eaters, I have not seen anything as pitiful as that young, comely leg, bitten off a little below the knee, as clean as though severed by the stroke of an axe, out of which the warm blood was trickling. While looking at the leg, I had forgotten all about the tigress, until I suddenly felt that I was in great danger. Hurriedly grounding the butt of the rifle, I put two fingers on the triggers, raising my head as I did so, and saw a little earth from the fifteen-foot bank in front of me come rolling down the steep side and plop into the pool. I was new to this game of man-eater hunting, or I should not have exposed myself to an attack in the way I had done. My prompt action in pointing the rifle upwards had possibly saved my life, and in stopping her spring or in turning to get away, the tigress had dislodged the earth from the top of the bank. The bank was too steep for scrambling, and the only way of getting up was to take it at a run. Going up the watercourse, a short distance I sprinted down, took the pool in my stride, and got far enough up the other side to grasp a bush and pull myself onto the bank a bed of strobilanthus, the bent stalks of which were slowly regaining their upright position, showed where and how recently the tigress had passed, and a little further on, under an overhanging rock, I found where she had left her kill when she came to have a look at me. Her tracks now, as she carried away the girl, led into a wilderness of rocks, some acres in extent, where the going was both difficult and dangerous. The cracks and chasms between the rocks were masked with ferns and blackberry vines, and a false step, which might easily have resulted in a broken limb, would have been fatal. Progress under these conditions was of necessity slow, and the tigress was taking advantage of it to continue her meal. A dozen times I found where she had rested, 
and after each of these rests, the blood trail became more distinct. This was her 436th human kill, and she was quite accustomed to being disturbed at her meals by rescue parties. But this, I think, was the first time she had been followed up so persistently, and she now began to show her resentment by growling. To appreciate a tiger's growl to the full, it is necessary to be situated as I then was, rocks all around with dense vegetation between, and the imperative necessity of testing each footstep to avoid falling headlong into unseen chasms and caves. I cannot expect you, who read this at your fireside, to appreciate my feelings at the time. The sound of the growling and the expectation of an attack terrified me at the same time as it gave me hope. If the tigress lost her temper sufficiently to launch an attack, it would not only give me an opportunity of accomplishing the object for which I had come, but it would enable me to get even with her for all the pain and suffering she had caused. The growling, however, was only a gesture, and when she found that instead of shooing me off, it was bringing me faster on her heels, she abandoned it. I had now been on her track for over four hours. Though I had repeatedly seen the undergrowth moving, I had not seen so much as a hair of her hide, and a glance at the shadows climbing up the opposite hillside warned me it was time to retrace my steps if I was to reach the village before dark. The late owner of the severed leg was a Hindu, and some portion of her would be needed for the cremation. So as I passed the pool, I dug a hole in the bank and buried the leg where it would be safe from the tigress and could be found when wanted. My companion on the rock was very relieved to see me. My long absence and the growling he had heard had convinced him that the tigress had secured another kill, and his difficulty, as he quite frankly admitted, was how he was going to get back to the village alone. I thought, when we were climbing down the watercourse, that I knew of no more dangerous proceeding than walking in front of a nervous man carrying a loaded gun. But I changed my opinion when on walking behind him he slipped and fell, and I saw where the muzzle of his gun, a converted .450 without a safety catch, was pointing. Since that day, except when accompanied by Ibbotson, I have made it a hard and fast rule to go alone when hunting man-eaters. For if one's companion is unarmed, it is difficult to protect him, and if he is armed, it is even more difficult to protect oneself. Arrived at the crest of the hill, where the man had hidden his boots, I sat down to have a smoke and think out my plans for the morrow. The tigress would finish what was left of the kill during the night and would to a certainty lie up among the rocks next day. On the ground she was on, there was very little hope of my being able to stalk her, and if I disturbed her without getting a shot, she would probably leave the locality and I should lose touch with her. A beat, therefore, was the only thing to do, provided I could raise sufficient men. I was sitting on the south edge of a great amphitheatre of hills, without a habitation of any kind in sight. A stream, entering from the west, had fretted its way down, cutting a deep valley right across the amphitheatre. To the east, the stream had struck solid rock, and turning north, had left the amphitheatre by a narrow gorge. The hill in front of me, rising to a height of some two thousand feet, was clothed in short grass, with a pine tree dotted here and there, and the hill to the east was too precipitous for anything but a kuril to negotiate. If I could collect sufficient men to man the entire length of the ridge from the stream to the precipitous hill, and get them to stir up the tigress, her most natural line of retreat would be through the narrow gorge. Admittedly, a very difficult beat, for the steep hillside facing north, on which I left the tigress, was densely wooded, and roughly three-quarters of a mile long and half a mile wide. However, if I could get the beaters to carry out instructions, there was a reasonable chance of my getting a shot. The Tahsildar was waiting for me at the village. I explained the position to him, and asked him to take immediate steps to collect as many men as he could, and to meet me at the tree where the girl had been killed at ten o'clock the following morning. Promising to do his best, he left for Champavat, while I climbed the hill to the bungalow. 
I was up at crack of dawn next morning, and after a substantial meal told my men to pack up and wait for me at Champavad, and went down to have another look at the ground I intended beating. I could find nothing wrong with the plans I had made, and an hour before my time I was at the spot where I had asked the Tasildar to meet me. That he would have a hard time in collecting the men I had no doubt, for the fear of the man-eater had sunk deep into the countryside, and more than mild persuasion would be needed to make the men leave the shelter of their homes. At ten o'clock the Tasildar and one man turned up, and thereafter the men came in twos and threes and tens, until by midday two hundred and ninety-eight had collected. The Tasildar had let it be known that he would turn a blind eye towards all unlicensed firearms, and further, that he would provide ammunition where required, and the weapons that were produced that day would have stocked a museum. When the men were assembled and had received the ammunition they needed, I took them to the brow of the hill where the girl's skirt was lying, and pointing to a pine tree on the opposite hill that had been struck by lightning and stripped of bark, I told them to line themselves up along the ridge, and when they saw me wave a handkerchief from under the pine, those of them who were armed were to fire off their pieces, while the others beat drums, shouted, and rolled down rocks, and that no one was on any account to leave the ridge until I returned and personally collected him. When I was assured that all present had heard and understood my instructions, I set off with the Tasildar, who said he would be safer with me than with the beaters, whose guns would probably burst and cause many casualties. Making a wide detour, I crossed the upper end of the valley, gained the opposite hill, and made my way down to the blasted pine. From here the hill went steeply down, and the Tasildar, who had a thin pair of patent leather shoes, said it was impossible for him to go any further. While he was removing his inadequate footgear to ease his blisters, the men on the ridge, thinking I had forgotten to give the prearranged signal, fired off their guns and set up a great shout. I was still a hundred and fifty yards from the gorge, and that I did not break my neck a dozen times in covering this distance was due to my having been brought up on the hills and being in consequence as sure-footed as a goat. As I ran down the hill, I noticed that there was a patch of green grass near the mouth of the gorge, and as there was no time to look round for a better place, I sat down in the grass with my back to the hill down which I had just come. The grass was about two feet high and hid half of my body, and if I kept perfectly still, there was a good chance of my not being seen. Facing me was the hill that was being beaten, and the gorge that I hoped the tigress would make for was behind my left shoulder. Pandemonium had broken loose on the ridge. Added to the fusillade of guns was the wild beating of drums and the shouting of hundreds of men, and when the din was at its worst, I caught sight of the tigress bounding down a grassy slope between two ravines to my right front and about three hundred yards away. She had only gone a short distance when the Tahsildar, from his position under the pine, let off both barrels of his shotgun. On hearing the shots, the tigress whipped round and went straight back the way she had come, and as she disappeared into thick cover, I threw up my rifle and sent a despairing bullet after her. The men on the ridge, hearing the three shots, not unnaturally concluded that the tigress had been killed. They emptied all their guns and gave a final yell, and I was holding my breath and listening for the screams that would herald the tigress's arrival on the ridge, when she suddenly broke cover to my left front, and, taking the stream at a bound, came straight for the gorge. The point five hundred modified cordite rifle sighted at sea level, shot high at this altitude, and when the tigress stopped dead, I thought the bullet had gone over her back, and that she had pulled up on finding her retreat cut off. As a matter of fact, I had hit her all right, but a little far back. Lowering her head, she half turned towards me, giving me a beautiful shot at the point of her shoulder at a range of less than thirty yards. She flinched at this second shot, but continued, with her ears laid flat and bared teeth, to stand her ground, while I sat with rifle to shoulder, trying to think what it would be best for me to do when she charged, 
for the rifle was empty and I had no more cartridges. Three cartridges were all that I had brought with me, for I never thought I should get a chance of firing more than two shots, and the third cartridge was for an emergency. Fortunately, the wounded animal most unaccountably decided against a charge. Very slowly she turned, crossed the stream to her right, climbed over some fallen rocks, and found a narrow ledge that went diagonally up and across the face of the precipitous hill to where there was a great flat projecting rock. Where this rock joined a cliff, a small bush had found root hold, and going up to it, the tigress started to strip its branches. Throwing caution to the winds, I shouted to the Tahsildar to bring me his gun. A long reply was shouted back. The only word of which I caught was, Feet. Laying down my rifle, I took the hill at a run, grabbed the gun out of the Tahsildar's hands, and raced back. As I approached the stream, the tigress left the bush and came out on the projecting rock towards me. When I was within twenty feet of her, I raised the gun and found to my horror that there was a gap of about three-eighths of an inch between the barrels and the breech block. The gun had not burst when both barrels had been fired, and would probably not burst now, but there was danger of being blinded by a blowback. However, the risk would have to be taken, and aligning the great blob of a bead that did duty as a sight on the tigress's open mouth, I fired. Maybe I bobbed, or maybe the gun was not capable of throwing the cylindrical bullet accurately for twenty feet. Anyway, the missile missed the tigress's mouth and struck her on the right paw, from where I removed it later with my fingernails. Fortunately, she was at her last gasp, and the tap on the foot was sufficient to make her lurch forward. She came to rest with her head projecting over the side of the rock. From the moment the tigress had broken cover in her attempt to get through the gorge, I had forgotten the beaters, until I was suddenly reminded of their existence by hearing a shout from a short distance up the hill of, There it is on the rock! Pull it down and let us hack it to bits! I could not believe my ears when I heard, Hack it to bits! And yet I had heard all right for others now had caught sight of the tigress, and from all over the hillside the shout was being repeated. The ledge by which the wounded animal had gained the projecting rock was fortunately on the opposite side from the beaters, and was just wide enough to permit my shuffling along it sideways. As I reached the rock and stepped over the tigress, hoping devoutly she was dead, for I had not had time to carry out the usual test of pelting her with stones, the men emerged from the forest, and came running across the open, brandishing guns, axes, rusty swords, and spears. At the rock, which was twelve to fourteen feet in height, their advance was checked, for the outer face had been worn smooth by the stream when in spate and afforded no foothold even for their bare toes. The rage of the crowd on seeing their dreaded enemy was quite understandable, for there was not a man among them who had not suffered at her hands. One man, who appeared demented and was acting as ringleader, was shouting over and over again as he ran to and fro, brandishing a sword. This is the shaitan, or devil, that killed my wife and my two sons. As happens with crowds, the excitement died down as suddenly as it had flared up, and to the credit of the man who had lost his wife and sons, be it said, that he was the first to lay down his weapon. He came near to the rock and said, We were mad, Sahib, when we saw our enemy, but the madness has now passed, and we ask you and the Dasildar Sahib to forgive us. Extracting the unspent cartridge, I laid the gun across the tigress and hung down by my hands and was assisted to the ground. When I showed the men how I had gained the rock, the dead animal was very gently lowered and carried to an open spot where all could crowd round and look at her. When the tigress had stood on the rock looking down at me, I had noticed that there was something wrong with her mouth, and on examining her now I found that the upper and lower canine teeth on the right side of her mouth were broken, the upper one in half and the lower one right down to the bone. This permanent injury to her teeth, the result of a gunshot wound, had prevented her from killing her natural prey, and had been the cause of her becoming a man-eater. 
the men begged me not to skin the tigress there, and asked me to let them have her until nightfall, to carry it through their villages, saying that if their womenfolk and children did not see her with their own eyes, they would not believe that their dreaded enemy was dead. Two saplings were now cut and laid, one on either side of the tigress, and with puggaris, waistbands, and loin cloths, she was carefully and very securely lashed to them. When all was ready, the saplings were manned, and we moved to the foot of the precipitous hill. The men preferred to take the tigress up this hill, on the far side of which their villages lay, to going up the densely wooded hill which they had just beaten. Two human ropes were made by the simple expedient of the man behind, taking a firm grip of the waistband or other portion of clothing of the man in front of him. When it was considered that the ropes were long and strong enough to stand the strain, they attached themselves to the saplings, and with men on either side to hold the feet of the bearers and give them foothold, the procession moved up the hill, looking for all the world like an army of ants carrying a beetle up the face of a wall. Behind the main army was a second and a smaller one, the Tahsildar being carried up. Had the ropes broken at any stage of that thousand-foot climb, the casualties would have been appalling, but the rope did not break. The men gained the crest of the hill and set off eastwards, singing on their triumphal march, while the Tahsildar and I turned west and made for Jambavad. Our way lay along the ridge, and once again I stood among the blackthorn bushes on the thorns of which long tresses of the girl's hair had caught, and for the last time I looked down into the amphitheatre which had been the scene of our recent exploit. On the way down the hill the beaters had found the head of the unfortunate girl, and a thin column of smoke rising straight up into the still air from the mouth of the gorge showed where the relations were performing the last rites of the Champavat man-eater's last victim, on the very spot in which the man-eater had been shot. After dinner, while I was standing in the courtyard of the Tahsil, I saw a long procession of pine torches winding its way down the opposite hillside, and presently the chanting of a hill-song by a great concourse of men was borne up on the still night air. An hour later, the tigress was laid down at my feet. It was difficult to skin the animal with so many people crowding round, and to curtail the job, I cut the head and paws from the trunk and left them adhering to the skin to be dealt with later. A police guard was then mounted over the carcass, and next day, when all the people of the countryside were assembled, the trunk, legs, and tail of the tigress were cut up into small pieces and distributed. These pieces of flesh and bone were required for the lockets which hill children wear round their necks, and the addition of a piece of tiger to the other potent charms is credited with giving the wearer courage as well as immunity from the attacks of wild animals. The fingers of the girl, which the tigress had swallowed whole, were sent to me in spirits by the Tahsildar and were buried by me in the Nainital lake close to the Nanda Devi temples. While I had been skinning the tigress, the Tahsildar and his staff, assisted by the headmen and greybeards of the surrounding villages and merchants of the Chambavat Bazaar, had been busy drawing up a program for a great feast and dance for the morrow, at which I was to preside. Round about midnight, when the last of the great throng of men had left, with shouts of delight at being able to use roads and village paths that the man-eater had closed for four years, I had a final smoke with the Tahsildar, and telling him that I could not stay any longer, and that he would have to take my place at the festivities, my men and I set off on our seventy-five-mile journey, with two days in hand to do it in. At sunrise I left my men, and with the tigress's skin, strapped to the saddle of my horse, rode on ahead to put in a few hours in cleaning the skin at Devithura, where I intended spending the night. When passing the hut on the hill at Bali, it occurred to me that it would be some little satisfaction to the dumb woman to know that her sister had been avenged. So leaving the horse to browse, he had been bred near the snow line and could eat anything from oak trees to nettles. I climbed the hill to the hut and spread out the skin with the head supported on a stone facing the door. The children of the house had been round-eyed spectators of these proceedings, and hearing me talk to them, their mother, who was inside cooking, came to the door. I am not going to hazard any theories about shock and countershock, 
for I know nothing of these matters. All I know is that this woman, who was alleged to have been dumb a twelve month, and who four days previously had made no attempt to answer any of my questions, was now running backwards and forwards from the hut to the road, calling to her husband and the people in the village to come quickly and see what the sahib had brought. This sudden return of speech appeared greatly to mystify the children, who could not take their eyes off their mother's face. I rested in the village while a dish of tea was being prepared for me, and told the people who thronged round how the man-eater had been killed. An hour later I continued my journey, and for half a mile along my way I could hear the shouts of goodwill of the men of Pali. I had a very thrilling encounter with a leopard the following morning, which I only mention because it delayed my start from Devithura and put an extra strain on my small mount and myself. Fortunately, the little pony was as strong on his legs as he was tough inside, and by holding his tail on the upgrades, riding him on the flat, and running behind him on the downgrades, we covered the forty-five miles to Nainital between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. At a darbar held in Nainital a few months later, Sir John Hewitt, Lieutenant Governor of the United Provinces, presented the Tahsildar of Champavat with a gun, and the man who accompanied me when I was looking for the girl with a beautiful hunting knife, for the help they had given me. Both weapons were suitably engraved, and will be handed down as heirlooms in the respective families. The End <laughs>